Hey everyone, and welcome back to this introduction to India and South Asia. I'm Benjamin Siegel, and I'm really happy that you're joining me again today. We spent a lot of time the last time we met talking about the political, the administrative, the military, and the economic developments that characterized the new British state in India. But today we're going to turn a little more to the realm of culture. We're going to talk about tradition and reform in early British India, and the different ways in which Indian religious and cultural life began to interact in new ways with the efforts of British reformers. And then we're going to talk about a moment of failure in 1857, when a good part of northern India erupted into open rebellion against the political, economic, and cultural changes that had taken place on the Indian subcontinent. Let's set the scene. It's the end of the 1820s, and it seemed to the British rulers of India that the old barriers of custom and tradition and superstition were going to finally give way to the overwhelming power of liberal British ideas of progress. It's important to remember that this was a very unique time in British history. Britain had just defeated Napoleon in European wars. It really was the only place on earth where the Industrial Revolution was in full effect. and it had become the workshop of the world this was the time that evangelical christianity began to take root in india and britain saw themselves for the first time as the stewards of a religion that had the promise of salvation and which needed to be shared with all people around the world you probably know some of the big optimistic liberal voices of the day those are men and they're mostly men like adam smith jeremy bentham james and john stuart mill The idea of liberalism was the idea that progress and rationality would eventually touch every corner of human experience. And it wasn't just something that would be limited to Great Britain. It was something that could go beyond western civilization and transform all religion and all cultures and all nations. This was the time that James Mill was writing his History of British India, and in it he wrote that Indians were the most enslaved portion of the human race. But even he believed that it would be possible that through liberalism Indians could shake off the despotism, the superstition, and the old habits that were holding it back from becoming a modern corner of the world. A while back we talked about the orientalists. These were the scholars of India in Europe who believed that while India's ancient past had a lot to admire, the country had slipped into decay, disarray, degeneration. But the liberals who came But the liberals who came in this period didn't even have this kind of grudging respect for India's culture and civilization. Thomas Macaulay, one of the governor generals of British India, wrote that the entire native literature of India and Arabia is not worth a single shelf of a good European library. Macaulay's attitude basically sums up the liberal sentiment. Britons had often held out the idea, particularly at home, that they were in India to help Indians. They wanted to empower Indians to build their own country. But Macaulay also wrote that it was his goal to create a nation that was fundamentally English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. In a long time, men like Macaulay believed that India was going to be transformed. Maybe it would be independent eventually, but it would still embody an imperishable empire of British arts and morals, literatures and laws. One figure gets really associated with the idea of liberal reform in India, and that's Lord William Bentinck. Bentinck became India's governor general in 1828, and he had a 7-year rule. And it's his name that gets most associated with the strong, big, high water mark of the liberal agenda in India. Bentinck came in with big goals for the Indian subcontinent, but he knew it wasn't going to be an easy task. The East India Company had a shoestring budget in spite of the excesses that it was shipping back home, and he knew that he was never going to be able to move as fast as he wanted because Indians would object. So he picked some low-hanging fruit to start with. And that was by abolishing the practice of sati in 1829. The idea was that when a man died, her husband would throw herself on a cremation fire with the goal of dying with him. The English were completely obsessed with sati, the idea of death becoming this public spectacle. Some of the earliest English writers looking at sati had seen it as a heroic or romantic act of sacrifice, but by the time the liberals were in power, it was mostly seen as this sign that India was a land that was barbarous, it was bloodthirsty, it had a faith that was wholly irrational. For the British, the idea of sati represented the failings of men in particular. 
they were seen as lacking the masculinity or the strength to nurture or empower women as opposed to degrading them. So Britain saw themselves as needing to take on the task of abolishing sati and protecting Indian women. Bendik had a big agenda that was supported by most liberal and evangelical opinion, but he was very careful to try to get Indian support for his project of abolishing sati as well. He put together a panel of pundits. They got together and they assured him that the practice wasn't necessary in Hindu scripture. And so he was able to frame his actions as that of an enlightened, even Hindu-seeming ruler. The only problem was, sati wasn't even that common in India at that time. By the highest estimates, there were maybe around 800 cases per year in Bengal, which wasn't nearly as pervasive as British administrators believed. Europeans living in India would write in their letters to friends back in England about sati as this kind of barbaric practice, but most of them admitted that they had never actually seen the practice take place. So sati was a perfect first step. It was able to satisfy this liberal impulse of reform, but it really wouldn't upset that many people. There were bigger problems at the time, like widespread female infanticide, that the liberals didn't even touch. But perhaps the biggest intervention that the liberals made was in the realm of education. From the time that the company had arrived in India, they had patronized Sanskrit and Arabic education in India for Hindus and Muslims. They had established different colleges in Benares and Calcutta. But over time, this policy of supporting native language education came under attack from those who believed that English needed to be the language of public life in India. They insisted that it would be Western subjects and English language that would be at the heart of any education that the company sponsored. They ended up winning this battle. In 1835, Thomas Macaulay issued his famous Minute on Education. The Minute on Education was a celebration of English education, but it also was an attack about education in India. It held that the company was going to withdraw its support for publishing books in native languages. It would take away sponsorship for most colleges except for the big madrasa in Delhi and the Hindu college that was then in Benares. But it also took away the stipends that students received to study in these colleges. The money that was liberated would instead be used to fund education in English and other Western subjects. It's important to remember that at this point in time, England didn't have any publicly funded schools. But it was at this time that the British East India Company established government schools in many of India's major cities. This is an example, and we'll see it time and again, of ideas that get piloted in India before they're brought back to England. India serves as this kind of laboratory for British experimentations. This happened in lots of other realms. It happened with the idea of surveys, of publicly funded cemeteries, and the institution of competitive exams to qualify you for the civil service. You would try things in India and then bring them back home to England. What we're talking about here is the impact of liberalism, but lots of Indians at this time simply called it reform. Indians had many different reactions to the big cultural changes taking place. Ever since Europeans had arrived in India, they had been working to come to terms with what they would make of Western culture and British rule. For many Indians, the idea of English and Western education became very attractive. In the early 19th century, the British had founded Hindu College in Calcutta. It was the first English language institution of higher learning in India, and by the 1830s, there were several thousand Indians studying in English in Calcutta. But it was always a balancing act for Indian students to decide how much they were going to take of Western culture and how much they would reject or remake. There were some groups that decided that they were going to take on the project of Western culture full-throatedly. The most famous group that met at Hindu College was one called Young Bengal. It was associated with its leader, Henry de Rosio, who was a convert to Christianity, so it meant that he had taken on a lot of Western culture itself. This group got together to eat beef, to drink whiskey, and to make fun of what they saw as irrational Hindu customs. Some of them joined de Rosio and converted to Christianity. Most groups weren't as radical as this. As they confronted new and big ideas that were coming from the West, most Indians tried to achieve a balance between tradition and reform. They wanted to balance what they saw as the values of Indian culture, which worked to sustain and uphold them, as well as the excitement that came from exposure to new ways of being. We should try to keep in mind that we're not establishing a binary here between ideas of tradition and reform, or tradition and modernity. Tradition had a lot of different meanings, and reform took on many different shapes. 
If you went away from the big cities in India at this time, reform didn't really mean engaging with the West. This was a time that saw a lot of Hindu reform as well. The bhakti tradition became important again, and it became very attractive to upwardly mobile lower caste groups who were trying to distance themselves from their backgrounds. Hinduism offered another possibility for reform. And so did Islam. One of the most important Islamic leaders was Shah Waliullah, who was the head of a reform movement that became extremely attractive to many Muslims in the same time period. They rejected a lot of the saint worship that had penetrated Indian Islam from Sufism, and they worked to establish what they saw as a closer adherence to the Quran and the Hadith. For many Muslims, this was a way of finding order and structure at a moment when everything was in flux. There's one figure who we really associate with this balancing of tradition and reform, and that's Ram Mohan Roy. Ram Mohan Roy was born in 1772. He was a Bengali scholar, and he was fluent in Sanskrit, in Arabic, in Persian, and English, and it wasn't surprising that he found employment with the East India Company. Ram Mohan Roy became one of the most original and creative thinkers of what later would be called the Bengal Renaissance. He drew upon ancient texts, the Vedas, the Upanishads, to prop up the idea of a modern and rational India. Ramon Roy wasn't very interested in the devotional traditions of Hinduism. He liked what Islam had to bring to the table in the form of its commitment to monotheism, and he liked the ethical values that he found at the heart of Christianity. But unlike the students in Young Bengal, Ramon Roy wasn't really attracted to Christian doctrine. He believed that it wasn't fully rational, and he saw that Hinduism had something more rational to offer in his place. He was the first Indian figure who was able to give a big intellectual challenge to the missionaries arriving in India around this time. Ramahan Roy was connected to some of the biggest ideas of the day. He began to correspond with Unitarians around the world, and so there were letters that he exchanged with figures in Bristol and in Boston. Eventually, Ramahan Roy would found a society called the Brahmosam, and the idea was that he would propagate these ideas among his growing band of followers. Ramohan Roy was offering something that was distinctly Indian. It was a social and a political program, but it was framed in terms of rationality and improvement. And so it made him an ally to liberal figures like Bentnik. In addressing some of the major controversies of the day, like Sati, Ramohan Roy often found himself supporting English opinion, but he did so by relying upon Hindu texts and Hindu thinking. He tried to frame Hinduism to Christians as something that was fundamentally cut from the same cloth. He saw that the Hindu scriptures, as he called them, offered a similar grounding and ethical framework as Christianity itself did. Ramohan Roy wasn't perfect. He joined the English in denigrating Muslim rule, calling it a period of decline just like the British had. He thought of Hindus as India's original inhabitants and framed Muslims as basically outsiders. But Ramohan Roy remains valuable to us as a historical figure because he's someone who was trying to synthesize and bridge the gap between tradition and reform. It's hard to overstate just how fertile an intellectual period this was. There were major ideas that were being debated across Bengali society in particular. It was a time of debate, of intellectual exchange, artistic production, and later this period would be called the Bengal Renaissance. At the heart of the Bengal Renaissance were a group of Indians called the Bhadralok, really a class. That word translates to respectable people, but it really comprised a big group of educated merchants, clerks, government employees, and other professionals, most of whom were upper castes, and who had really prospered during this first half century of British rule. There was also a conservative reform in Bengali society at this time in the form of a group called the Dharma Sabha. The Dharma Sabha was founded a little after the Brahmo Samaj was, and it was supposed to rally support for what it saw as traditional Hinduism. But it wasn't even that conservative of a group. It supported English education, and while it opposed the abolition of Sati, it did so mostly by objecting to the colonial government's authority to intervene in social custom. What I'm trying to get at here is just how important and big a time this was for intellectual exchange in Bengal. There were lots of discussion groups that met together to debate the biggest ideas of the day. There was even a new word that came out of this called Adha, a Bengali word for informal gatherings and chats that took place in the houses of patrons or in new spaces like coffee houses. It wasn't just a time of informal exchange. There was also a big boom in the publication of books and the translation of texts from other languages into Bengali. 
Print culture was booming here, just like it was in Europe. All of these public meetings, pamphlets, voluntary societies that were meeting together ushered in the coming of a new kind of modernity to Bengali society. This was something that started in Calcutta but spread out through Bengal and even further afield. Things were also changing on the political front. This was the last moment of open conquest going on in India, and it was mostly taking place in the Northwest. The British prior to this point had mostly left the land of Punjab and India's Northwest alone. There was still a major Sikh general there, Ranjit Singh, who was running his own prosperous state there that had Sikhs, Muslims, and a massive army of around 25,000 soldiers. The British didn't want to waste resources on a conquest there. But in 1839, Ranjit Singh died and the British were tempted to enter into this territory. They went up through the lower Indus and at the end of the 1830s and early 1840s, the region of Sindh was conquered. There was a first Afghan war and the British sought to make Afghanistan into a new buffer state between British India and Russia. This is a period that would later be called the Great Game. The British efforts in Afghanistan, however, were disastrous. The British Indian Army was completely wiped out. There were 15,000 men killed there, and allegedly only one escaped to tell the tale. So while the British originally had some designs to conquer Afghanistan, they instead concentrated their energy on taking Punjab. In the wake of Ranjit Singh's death, there had been major disputes between different Sikh generals there, and in 1845, the first Sikh war broke out between the Sikh powers and Britain. Britain was ultimately successful in this battle, and one of the territories it acquired in this period was the Muslim territory of Kashmir, which would become a political hotspot for at least a century and a half to come. So in short, the early 19th century is a moment when there are big changes taking place across India and in Bengal in particular. The British East India Company had turned from a company into a giant colonial government. We talked before about how law, the economy, public administration, were transformed in this period, but so too were the realms of religion and culture against the backdrop of big political change and territorial acquisition. Let's zoom out a little bit. We've discussed how a foreign power, a tiny little island across the sea, arrived in India, first as merchant capitalists and then as rulers. We saw how the British in India slowly expanded their commercial and political power, how they established big advances in administration, economy, politics, we discussed some of the big social and religious reforms that came up and percolated in the wake of these transformations. But while all of this has been going on, the British have been setting up the stage for comeuppance. And that would happen pretty quickly after the end of this era of liberal reform. In 1857, a major revolt ripped across a large part of North India. This is one of the most important dates of colonial rule. It's seen as the dividing line between Company Raj and Crown Raj ruled by a private company, and then ruled by the British crown itself. There's a lot at stake when we talk about the events of 1857. Sympathizers of British rule would later call this moment a mutiny, but many Indians would call it the first war of independence. So as we talk about it, let's keep in mind the big significance that it holds as a dividing line in Indian history. In 1848, there was a new governor general appointed to India, the Marquis of Dalhousie. While his predecessor, Lord Bentnick, had concentrated on propagating liberal reform, Dalhousie believed that the British had to shore up their game in India. When he arrived in Calcutta, he had two big goals. The first goal was that he wanted to unify India. He wanted to make sure that British territorial rule and legal rule were consolidated. And secondly, he wanted to establish new networks of communications and transportation that would hold the country together. These were massive tasks. Dalhousie arrived in India at, right after the Second Sikh War, when Britain had annexed the rich province of Punjab. And so now India went all the way from Calcutta to the Khyber Pass. Dalhousie also took on a new military campaign in Burma in 1852, seeking to protect merchant interests there. So British India at this point was bigger than it had ever been before. Dalhousie was also frustrated by some of the administrative quirks of British India particularly the role that was still afforded to India's princes. Dalhousie believed that a modern state couldn't have all of these different types of sovereignties and fluid boundaries that had once been, that had once been possible in earlier regimes. Right upon his arrival, he wrote a note that would come to haunt him later. 
He wrote, I cannot conceive it possible for anyone to dispute the policy of taking advantage of every just opportunity which presents itself for consolidating the territories which already belong to us by taking possession of states that might lapse in the midst of them. It's a little confusing what he's talking about, but if you think about it, he's talking about princely rule who died without an heir. In the past, these princes used to adopt, but Dalhousie, ignored, but Dalhousie felt that adoption was illegitimate when it came to preserving royal lines. And so in seven years, he secured possession of seven very rich princely states. The most important one was Avon, which was exceedingly rich, and it was the last to be annexed in 1856. Dalhousie also worked to purge British payrolls of the pensions that they were still paying out to important Indian figures. Dalhousie also believed in technology, and he saw that the technologies that were being introduced in Britain and transforming the West had a new role to play in India. These were all technologies like the railway, the telegraph, the postal service, and steam transportation on the water. Dalhousie knew what he was talking about. He had worked in London as railways were being built at great speed in the 1840s, and he was convinced that a railway in India would extend the market for British manufactured goods in India. It would help secure access to cotton, which was emerging as an important cash crop in India, and it would help to promote military interests on the subcontinent. Railways proved instantly transformative. Before the widespread introduction of railways, it would take a British civil servant around 25 days to get from Calcutta to Punjab, and by the end of the 19th century, it would be just three days by train. Equally important was the introduction in 1854 of a government postal service. This was something that had proved very successful in Britain 15 years earlier, when the penny post had connected places through cheap postage. Now in India, mail could be sent any distance across the country for the same cost. This was a technology that proved immensely empowering. Individuals, voluntary societies, organizations, publishers could all communicate with one another across the country, and this would prove exceptionally important in the second half of the 19th century in particular. Another technology which was transforming British India was the introduction of improved steam power, which reduced the time that it took to sail from London to Calcutta. In the 1830s, if you send an exchange of letters back and forth between Britain and India, it might take up to two years. But by 1870, and especially after the Suez Canal had opened, a letter could arrive from London to Bombay and it might only take a month. So Dalhousie in these ways was very successful. By the middle of the 19th century, India was connected territorially. It had different parts of the country and easy communication with other parts. For administrators, this really felt like it was a blessing, but it also was something that was going to help facilitate open rebellion. Let's tell the story of what actually happened in 1857 before we start thinking about some of the underlying causes of the revolt and some of the interpretations that would come later. We'll zoom in on the Bengal army. And remember, this is an army staffed mostly by Indians and commanded by British officers. A year before the revolt in 1856, the colonial state passed something called the General Services Enlistment Act. And it required sepoys, again, Indian soldiers, to serve absolutely wherever the state wanted. Prior to this period, Indian soldiers had enjoyed a little bit of say in where they were posted, and mostly they were kept close to their home provinces. Some of these assignments took members of the Bengal army really far away from home. And soldiers were particularly upset when they were sent overseas to places like Burma. But also careers in the army were stagnating. Soldiers were dissatisfied with their salaries and the limited opportunities that they had for promotion. Dalhousie had also made a strategic blunder. When the East India Company annexed the province of Avud, the sepoys who had come from this province were upset by what they saw as an overturning of their rule. And this was a group that formed up to a third of the Bengal army. One of the most well-remembered causes of the mutiny was the introduction of a new rifle from Lee Enfield. There were rumors that circulated in the camps that in order to fire it, soldiers would need to bite off the end of each cartridge. This might have been okay, but the cartridge was rumored to be lubricated with either pig fat or cow fat, and this would be something that would be ritually defiling to both Hindus and Muslims. And so the sepoys in 1857 refused to load their rifles, and they were publicly humiliated by their officers, who punished them and even expelled some of them from service. A confrontation was brewing, and on May 9, 1857, 85 soldiers who had refused to load their rifles were led away in chains from their barracks in the North Indian city of Meerut. 
The next night, the remaining sepoys rose up. They massacred the English residents of the town and marched on to Delhi. When they arrived in Delhi, they sought help and support from the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah. Bahadur Shah didn't really have much to offer. He was old, he was a figurehead, he basically was just interested in poetry and the arts. But he did offer to lend support to the rebels, and it gave them an immense boost to their confidence. Soldiers flocked to the cause, and the British began to lose control over a broad stretch of northern India, from Bihar to Punjab, and even down into central India. Within a few weeks, lots of different groups had joined in. There were disaffected groups in the countryside, both landlords and peasants, princes and merchants, who all took on the cause of rebellion. Every group seemed to have a different strategy for participating in the revolt. Different people claimed ownership of the rebellion. The Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah did, the Queen of Ava did, the Maratha chief Nana Sahib did, but none of them were actually in charge. Occasionally, certain soldiers would use religious language. Muslims sometimes called this a jihad or a holy war. Religious rhetoric was often used to give justification, but it wasn't a unifying ideology for the Indians who rebelled. Lots of rebels who participated in the events of 1857 sought to either settle disputes with their neighbors or to rise up against landlords. Sometimes the participation of one leader in the uprising would make his rivals throw in their lot with the British so that they could gain advantage when things turned. There were also big geographic distinctions. The revolt was really concentrated in North India. It never went as far as the South, and it really didn't spread into Bengal. Its epicenter really was in Avad, a place which had been recently annexed and whose soldiers were deeply affected. There were those who remained loyal, like the Bombay Army and the Madras Army. The Bengal intelligentsia, its landlords, all of those people who had profited under company rule, the Bhadralok, and most of the princely rulers didn't have any interest in participating in a rebellion that didn't serve their causes. Sometimes there was open rebellion but private collaboration. Certain landlords who had revolted hedged their bets by sending representatives to the British camps. But the rebellion was bloody and brutal, and in some ways it was the most so in the cities. In Delhi and Lucknow and Kanpur, there were massive uprisings and the British put them down with deadly force and the unleashing of indiscriminate terror. They killed randomly as they spread out into the countryside and they called up racial justifications for what was taking place. Indian rebels were often not much better. When British soldiers and civilians at Kanpur surrendered to the Maratha chief Nana Sahib, he promised them safe passage away, but as they tried to get on boats to escape. He rained fire on them. The entire camp, including many women and children, were killed on the spot. But this period of open rebellion didn't last long. By September 1857, Delhi had been retaken. Bahadur Shah, the last Mughal emperor, was exiled to Burma. He died there, and his sons were murdered to put an end to the line. Eventually, cities like Lucknow and Kanpur were taken back. The Maratha leaders held out the longest, but by June 1858, the entire rebellion was over. Two months later in August, the British Parliament did something immensely important that would change the course of colonial rule. They passed what they called the Government of India Act, and it transferred all the remaining authority of the East India Company to the British Crown. The company existed, but at this point in time, it was a shell. Its trade monopoly had faded, authority was already shared between the company and the English parliament, and there was still that matter of being nominally subservient to the Mughal emperor. This whole arrangement seemed outdated to most Britons, especially as this strange sort of arrangement came to be implicated in assessments of what had caused the rebellion. So this was a moment when things were going to change. Beforehand, every 20 years, the British Crown had renewed the charter of the East India Company. But now the British Parliament would directly oversee Indian affairs. In London, there was a new cabinet position established, Secretary of State for India. It would be advised by a Council of India, and this group would have full authority for the government of the Indian subcontinent. That same year, Queen Victoria made a proclamation to the princes, chiefs, and people of India and she announced that there would be no more governor general there. That position would be replaced by the role of a viceroy, and that viceroy would have supreme authority over local decision-making. In Calcutta, he would have a 12-member executive council, and half of them were supposed to be non-officials, or people who were not employed by the colonial government. This seemed like a bureaucratic decision, but it would become much more important down the line. 
For the first time, there was a political calculus being made in the colonial government, that there would be a mix of representation between officials of the crown and non-officials. At the time, these were all white British officials, but this would provide the space that was needed for proportional representation down the road. In time, loyal elite Indians would begin to have the ear of the viceroy and the colonial government. This was an early form of constitutional reform, and it presaged big reforms to administration in India. Quickly after the rebellion, there were new bureaucratic structures put in place, new technical procedures, and the invention of new departments for the police, sanitation, forestry, finance. This was a moment of imperial consolidation, but at the same time it responded to what was seen in Britain as some of the causes of the revolt. This new proclamation that Queen Victoria made guaranteed princes would keep their titles and that their rights, dignity, and honor, as well as some sovereignty and control of their territory, would be ensured. This meant that until 1947, around a third of the population of India would remain under the indirect rule of around 500 princely families. But Queen Victoria's proclamation also added other things. It said that the Indian government would now work to promote the peaceful industry of India, to promote works of public utility and improvement. This was different than this earlier period of liberal reform. Queen Victoria explicitly said that she had no desire to impose our convictions on any of our subjects. She asked that all those who may be in authority under us abstain from interfering in Indian religious custom or belief and she promised that Britons would pay due regard to the ancient rites, usages, and customs of India. In Queen Victoria's proclamation, India was a land made up of different diverse people, different cultures, social organizations, religion, and it was only a foreign ruler who could keep all of that diversity in check. This is an ideology that was inherent in a new military organization that came up after the revolt. In the 1860s and 1870s, Britons came up with a pseudoscientific theory of martial races. The idea was that there were particular types of people or categories whose innate physical and moral characteristics made them appropriate soldiers. The British looked to groups like Punjabis, Sikhs, Jats, Rajputs, and Muslims, and certain Pathans and Nepali Gurkhas as particularly well-suited to military service. This ideology radically changed the army's composition. By 1875, half of the native army was Punjabi. Different regiments had been separated by ethnicity and religion, but now they were mixed together with the idea that mixed groups would be least likely to take up ethnic grievances against each other. British officials also sought to increase the proportion of British officials in the army. In 1857, British soldiers were only around a sixth of the Bengal army, but now the proportion of British to Indian soldiers was supposed to be kept at one to two or three. In the years after the rebellion, British officials were reassessing their estimation of different Indian populations. But these assessments were changing rapidly. Initially, the British had been the most suspicious of Muslims. They were seen as fanatics who were trying to restore Mughal or Muslim rule. But within two decades, Muslim elites and aristocrats were seen as important conservative figures who had roles to play in a reformed British empire. One of the most important of these Muslim loyalists was a man named Syed Ahmed Khan, who we're going to talk about very soon. Syed Ahmed Khan played a big role in helping to reimagine Muslims as conservative bulwarks for imperialism. In 1875, he established a school called the Anglo-Mohammedan College, which was an English-style institution that was supposed to cultivate gentlemanly skills and conservative politics. This was a group of Muslims who were supposed to be more appropriate for the new regime that was taking root in India. The British had been fundamentally shaken by the rebellion. There were novels that were written in the decades afterwards, and Victorian paintings, all of which celebrated the heroism of British soldiers and officers and denigrated Indians as opponents of Western civilization. There were big memorials that were established in India at this same point in time. There were stereoscopes that circulated in Britain that tried to show British audiences the sacrifices that soldiers had made in defending the crown. This was also a first period of tourism, and Kanpur in particular became the most important stop on a popular mutiny tour that was offered to British travelers. Remembering the events of 1857 helped the British imagine themselves as honorable defenders of civilization against barbarism. When we think about the events of 1857, it's important to remember that this wasn't really a war of independence. 
It was confined to certain areas, and it never really spread beyond them, certainly not to places like Bengal or the South. Despite the fact that soldiers turned to the Mughal emperor, it wasn't really an effort to reestablish the Mughal crown, which only had symbolic value in this period. And it probably wasn't a nationalist movement either, but that's something that we'll talk about later when we talk about the birth of nationalism in India. But it's impossible to dismiss the lasting importance of the events of 1857. It was a response to the different forms of political and cultural reform which had taken place the decades before, and the British dismissal of Indian sovereignty and Indian concerns. Its aftermath was long-lasting. It transformed the very structure of government, and it promoted new ideas about race and racial hierarchy. And for many Indians, the memories of 1857 would prove really vital in stoking nationalist sentiment. We've come a long way this time, and we've moved across a good part of the 19th century. We saw how a liberal effort to reform Indian society provoked big debates within it, not at all monolithic. Ultimately, we saw how these efforts and new political transformations set the stage for a major rebellion against imperial rule. Soon, we'll see how the British Crown doubled down on their efforts to squeeze Indian labor and raw materials out of the subcontinent and to distance Britons from Indians in new ways. We'll save that for next time. Thanks for joining me again. See you all soon.